guitar at all, no matter the style or genre or your experience level, you use guitar strings. In fact, that's probably the only thing that every guitar player in the history of the world has in common. We all use guitar strings. Now, the type of string and the gauge and the material and the construction are all different, but at the end of the day, we all play strings. I spent a lot of time thinking about guitar strings and trying out different brands and different gauges, uh, but I've never actually seen or known much about how the strings that I play were made. Where did they come from? How are they made? Who's making them? So a few weeks ago in Nashville, Tennessee, I had the opportunity to stop by Stringjoy String Makers there in Nashville uh, and get a tour of their facilities and find out how they build the strings. So in today's video, we're going to teach you everything that you need to know about guitar strings, specifically electric guitar strings and how they're made. Now, before we get started, two quick things. This video is not sponsored by Stringjoy or anyone else for that matter. Uh, I got in touch with Scott, the owner of Stringjoy. They have sent me a few packs of strings in the past to try out, but this is in no way paid for or sponsored or anything like that. And also there's an extended cut version of this video available over on the inner circle. You can find out more information down below, but the extended cut goes more in depth into differences in string gauges and the differences between phosphor bronze and 80-20 bronze and uh, you know nickel plated steel and all that kind of stuff. So if you want more information or you want to take an even deeper dive on this string conversation, check out the inner circle. You can sign up for $10 a month and get access to not just the extended cut of this video, but also all of the extra content that we're making over there. And early access to my new video course, which we are wrapping up and will be launching in August. So with all that out of the way, let's jump back in time to a few weeks ago in Nashville, Tennessee, and take a tour of the Stringjoy factory. Um, so strings are made of wire, and basically there's two different types, as you see, like a wound guitar string. You have core wire and then wrap wire. Plain strings are just core wire. So right. we have two different types of our core wire here. Uh, this stuff is all round. Um, so this is what goes into like your plain strings, or yep. also like a vintage style round core. Um, that you see, it's all round core here. Right. Uh, hexagonal core, which has got became pretty popular in the 70s and is now like very widely used, um, is this stuff here. So that's going to be like if you cut it crosswise, you'll see a hexagon sure. that creates six little edges that help anchor the wrap of the string the whole way. Okay. Um, round core strings, which we make too, are a little bit more involved. So, um, so like tonally. What's the difference between round core and, and hex core? Yeah, so generally people find that hex core will have a little bit more brightness and has a little bit better stability over the life of the string. Okay. Round core is generally known to be more flexible in terms of feel and a little bit warmer, a little boomy. Yeah. Thingly, you know, guitar string makers used to use pure nickel for the wrap wire, which was super expensive. And they developed nickel plated steel mostly as a way to cut costs. Right. So there's still nickel on the outside, but it's steel in the middle, which is a lot cheaper than nickel. Uh, the like sort of tonal preferences that guitarists developed towards nickel plated steel were like totally just by accident. Right. Uh, it is a little bit brighter and snappier. It's more what people expect these days. Yeah. Uh, but again, cost cutting. Yeah. Nice. Uh, we also in this dry room uh, keep all of our wound strings that are coiled and ready to go into sets. Uh, this one's humidity controlled. It's super dry and kind of hot. Yeah, I can <laughs> feel it. Like yeah. Yeah, it, it feels like being in a desert. <laughs> yeah, you know? it is a little. Um, so I'll show you some of the wrap wire that we yeah. use, and then we can take a look at the winding and all that. Nice, man. Let's do it. You uh, cut it after that one while we talk. I just want to get the. Super cool. Yeah, down this long, narrow hallway. So, no. with string gauge, mm -hmm. is this uh, the same as like your typical AWG? rating system or is it a different gauge it's inspired system? by but it's a different gauge system okay. yeah it's funny we use the term gauge and it doesn't mean gauge right. at it all mean because up. with awg the higher you go like a 40 awg is right. smaller for this we're just reading this off so when you see like string gauges that's in thousandths of an inch oh okay a 36 is 36 thousandths of an inch our wire is spec to the same um, so here you see our phosphor bronze wire, which has that familiar sort of reddish color. Right. It's 92% copper, so it has all that red from the copper. 80-20 uh, bronze, a lot more yellow. That's 80% copper, 20% zinc. Right. Over here we've got a lot of nickel plated steel, which is our most popular yep. here. Yep. And then back over here we've got pure nickel as well. We have nice. some flat wire hanging down there for some experiments. All the stuff behind you is coated wire that we'll be launching here soon. Right. Uh, we even got some rope core and stuff for classical strings. Classical strings doesn't use don't use a steel core; they use a nylon core. Uh, as you can see, these come on generally smaller sure. spools. They run a little bit easier on the machines that way. 
Um, and there's tons of different sizes that we use for different things. We have different recipes for a given string. Um, yeah. On a 26, you could do a 10 core with an 8 gauge wrap wire to right. get there. That's not exactly what we would do. That'd be a bad idea. Or you could do a 20 gauge core with a 3 wrap wire. That's really interesting. I've never considered that. So you're talking about the wound strings. Yep. You can have a larger core with a smaller wind or mm -hmm. a larger wind with a smaller core exactly. on, on the same, like on a you know, D string, for example. Yep. So what, what would cause you to make one decision over another? Yep, so it's tone and feel. Okay. You know, and every string manufacturer will use slightly different specs right. uh, for how they want to make their 36, and that'll affect how it plays. A thicker core will just be a little bit stiffer. Right. Um, a thinner core will be a lot more flexible, but also might break a little bit easier. Right. So it's all kind of playing that game, getting a, a core that's going to be strong enough to hold up for a long time, right. but getting enough wrap wire on the, the string that it has the sound that you're looking for. With something like an acoustic string, more the some people call the wrap wire the tone wire, mm -hmm. that's more of where your sound is coming from. In electric, nickel plated steel is considered fairly bright, pure nickel is considered warm. But all that's really happening is the mid character is changing. Got it. With electric, nickel plated steel is more mid forward, phosphor bronze is a little bit more scooped. You Got have it. a good bass response and good treble, less mids. But on electric, people call that warm. Right. On acoustic, people call it bright. Right. These Got tone it. words, you know, they can right. be a little bit fuzzy. Okay, you want to cool. see how a string's actually made? Yeah, I would love to see Sweet. that. That'd be really cool. Phil, this is Red, and it was hey, man. Chris. Hi, Red. Chris. Phil, yeah. nice to meet you. What's yeah. your name, bud? Chris. Chris, nice to meet you, man. Yeah. All right, so we're here on one of our newer machines. We have some older machines that we've modified a lot and some, some brand new ones. This one we just got in, we're really liking. It helps us control a lot of things about the process even better. Uh, but Phil's one of our winders here. He's going, what are you running right now? Uh, on top, I'm running uh, 30 MPS, and then on the bottom, I am running 80, 20, 44. Okay. So you're doing awesome. two strings at one time? Correct. Yep. Yep. Cool. Mm -hmm. So what he's going to do, he's going to load a core wire onto the string itself. He's going to secure the wrap wire, which is being tensioned along the way. Uh, and then once he's got that good, he's going to let it run. Now, it takes a while to dial these in when we put on a new gauge. He's been running these a little bit, so they should mostly just kind of go like smooth like butter. But when we first uh, put a string on, there's a lot of dialing in and measuring and adjusting to get everything just right. So it should look easy now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's go ahead. So there he's securing that wrap wire onto the core wire so that when it runs, it'll be locked in and solid. Cool. And then we break it off so that there's nothing sticking out at the end with the little tail. Here he's jogging it a little bit and he's going to let it go. And you can see through here, it's being wound. These guys are dampening the rotation of the string so that the core wire doesn't move too quickly and cause any sort of issues. Wow. And this angle that it's being wrapped at and the tension that we have controlling the wrap wire is what determines a good consistent string. A good yeah. consistent string should be the same size the whole way through. And we'll feel every one we're done to make sure it's perfectly smooth. So that's beautiful. You guys are holding cameras, but. Oh yeah. Yeah, perfectly smooth all the way through. And again, you know, we're controlling the tension of the core wire, the tension on the wrap wire as it winds so that it's not too small or too big at a certain right. place. The angle that's being wound at so you don't have any gaps, everything's just right. Yeah, yeah so you can see the bronze on a spool down there coming up through a tensioning system. Okay, so it comes up. Yep. It's goes a around this whole pulley. tensioning system. Got it. And then it comes through here. Those are Dialing it in for certain tensions, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you have to reset, or for certain gauges, you have to reset the tension for a certain gauge or else you'll- Every time, yeah, right. yep. absolutely. And we measure as we go to make sure everything is good, to ensure that everything is consistent. And we have generally rather tight specs. machine has one job and it is to apply a brass ball end onto a specific length of core wire and we can adjust how many times it's twisted how much wire is hanging out to get a very nice tight twist this is core wire so it doesn't have that loop uh, twist at the end that you usually see for playing it's so cool man it's so like cathartic to sit and watch that thing oh I know <laughs> spin around it's yeah. it's lovely it makes it, me it very makes happy it makes a good sound too yep. it's like very 
Bridger here, actually, one of our winders, the last time we did a shop tour, he grabbed some sounds from it and made yeah. a beat with it, yeah. which is pretty fun. Yeah, that's cool, man. I want to show you one of these machines, too. So this will be doing the same thing as the machine we did over there, but this is from the late 70s. Okay. Uh, this is the first two machines that we bought. They used to make strings for Jimmy DeQuisto, the DeQuisto string yep. company. Yep. Um, so we make the same strings over here as we do over there, but these require a little bit more skill. So we usually sure. have Bridges been making strings for a long time. Cool. Uh, it's a little bit more manual. There's a lot of adjustments that he's doing over the course of the line. Oh my God, so many questions. How are you setting the speed that this is running down the track for each? Is that something you're manually dialing in for each string gauge? Yes, yeah, so this one's kind of funny. On, on Phil's machine that you saw earlier, that's running with servo motors, so right. we're able to program a particular speed. On this one, it uses an old sewing machine gearbox, um, okay. which we have to replace them periodically because they can wear out a little bit. It's called a Zero Max. So right. this takes the input speed that it's spinning the core, right. and you can adjust the gear so that it's going a certain ratio of as fast as that core wire is, which keeps it going the whole way. But still, because there's no feedback like we have on those where it's adjusting to keep the angle just right, on this one we have to have a person that's riding that carriage so to be right. So you're like, right. by feel, you're sitting there like running it and just feeling it out the right way. Yeah, like if it runs too far forward, you gotta like put a little pressure to keep it back. Do the same thing if it runs back, pull forward. Just adjust that a little bit, get it just right. What happens if you get it wrong and it starts to bind up on it? It ends up down here. Oh. <laughs> and you can see over there too, all of uh Oh yeah. <laughs> the stream so graveyard? Yeah, there's there's plenty. It happens a lot. Right. Yeah, like I said, when you're putting on a new gauge and you have to dial it in, the first, you know, several strings are not going to be good. Sure. At least for, for us, they're not going to be good. Yeah, right. So they end up in there. We do work with a company in town called Strings for Hope that turns this all into jewelry. Oh, yeah, cool. um, They're a nonprofit, so something happens of it. It yeah, doesn't so just get, get thrown get away. Yeah, sure. So yep. you have two, four, six, eight machines yep. running? Right now, and, and more coming, too. So how many, how many, like, packs of strings can you make in a day, generally? That's a great question. Yeah, let's see. I think in terms of grosses, um, because manufacturing, so yeah. gross is 144. Okay. Uh, so in general, in a day right now, we're able to make about nine grosses of finished strings. Got it. Um, so that's a little bit over, quick math, 1,200 to 1,300. Um, we have that increasing all the time. Right. Demand's been really high, so yeah. we're adding to get new, new machines. All right, John, you're right. on. So John's our longest tenured employee. He actually is the manager of all the fulfillment area, but right now he's pitching in and coiling some strings. So he'll make it look very easy, but it always, when we start somebody, it takes somebody a while to get the feel down for coiling strings. Yeah, just strings. to get a nice, you know. But the thing is, what he's doing isn't just coiling a string and putting it in an envelope. He's yeah. feeling the string as it goes the whole way. Right. Uh, again, as a secondary check for smoothness. We have the winders do it because we don't want to make it gross and then find out later that it's bad. Um, but you'll still, I'm sure, every day find a couple of strings that yep. There's sneak always by those guys. Come by. Even the planes, which is harder for them to do because yep. they're just taking the raw material and making the strings out of it. Right. So we'll find those, but um, you know, I'm checking the consistency of the wine with this hand. Well, in this hand, I can kind of feel around, um, feel around the ball joint and Make sound sure like a doctor. Yeah. the cut is good, um, make sure everything is smooth up top. Yeah. You know, it just brings the consistency of the quality of the string. Yeah. We've thought about automating this side before, because um, it seems like we could certainly build a machine that would do it. The trouble there is, I went out here and I asked the guys, you know, how many strings do you find on a day or two? And they're both like, eh, you know, six to eight, you know, that kind of sneak by over about 6,000 strings we coil every day. Mm -hmm. um, That's not bad. Though. It's not a bad rate for what's sneaking through there, but I don't want six to eight out. yeah players finding a set with a bum string in it yeah. so to me you know it's, it's more expensive to have humans doing it certainly than having a machine doing it but that's what you need to be a premium string you know yeah. you need as many of those checks as possible right yeah i've uh, i've tried doing that before you know it's like the coil yeah, yeah you you pull out a pack and you only need one string yep. on a gig and i can't it's like <laughs> inevitably it ends up weird and out of shape and i just like have to stick it in a case or something well, we itself. even do it in a way that like i'll only wrap it around once 
That way, if it goes in the envelope, it can kind of expand on itself. That way, it's not restricted and kind of... Yeah. When you almost, see those really tight coils, yeah. uh, it can like misshape the string as it stays there forever. Yeah, we so do we it just, looser so it can spread out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. We're going to show these fellas you making some sets of strings. Cool. So what Mark in here will do, uh, we'll build some sets for you know stock that are our regular sets. John sometimes will make large quantities of those for dealers and stuff too. Right. Um, but we have a lot of custom set orders, right? So we'll get a roll of all the different custom sets that we have to make. Got it. And he'll take a look at these one at a time, grab each gauge, put them together into a set, uh, seal it up, pop it in a box, and then label it, which you'll see him do. So, okay, I have questions about yeah. custom sets. I've never ordered a custom set of strings. So what's the thought process behind it, and what would you tell someone who's thinking about getting into getting, like ordering their own gauge? set of strings. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple reasons you might do it, right? The, the most obvious is people that are playing in alternate tunings. Most, a lot of folks have been playing in dadgad with 10 to 46s forever, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Right. So if you're playing in an alternate tuning, it's a great idea to build a set that balances those tensions and performs really well for that too. But also sometimes people like me can be a little persnickety and just want like, hey, I want things a little bit like lighter on the bottom to try to really get that country twang on my yeah. telly. I need a little bit heavier up top so that it still kind of maintains that fullness. So that could be a great reason too. Um, we do offer a tension calculator at tension.stringjoy.com where you can kind of play around and find out the tensions to each gauge and okay. put in your, your particular scale length or your multi-scale length set and design something that fits to you. Right. Um, but also we design them for, I'd say probably 60-70% of players that buy custom sets. I mean, you know how it is. You go to Guitar Center and it's like a wall of, of strings. So what is some good things for someone to know to make an educated choice on what strings to get for their Les Paul or their strap. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, at the most basic level, my go-to thing is always to tell folks they can reach out to our support team, even if they're not customers of ours, uh, and they'll help them out because we do have people that are experts at that. Uh, that's support at stringjoy.com, our email, where you can always do that. Uh, but for people otherwise, the best answer is to try things and, and see what you like. Trying different brands can be important too, but I always recommend people trying different gauges a lot. Um, I myself have guitars these days, some with 8s and some with 12s on them. But a lot of players, you know, fall into ruts, and I do think mixing up your string gauges is like one of the best ways to bust out of a rut. Cool. Uh, if you play 11s and you put 9s on a guitar, you can't play the way that you play with 11s right. on a guitar. Right. It forces you to refigure it out. Yeah. Uh, I thought I hated 9s, and I put some on my uh, my 339. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I had to totally readjust how I was playing. In general, I think people just kind of fall into ruts, or they don't explore quite as much as as they probably should. You know, for a long time, guitar strings were like. Nines, tens, and elevens, right? It's like if they sold like shoes and a small, medium, and a large. Right. You'd be like, oh, I'm a medium shoe. What do you mean? I'm like, well, <laughs> right. you're probably not exactly a medium shoe. You're right. probably like a six and a half or a nine and a half. And then, so for custom sets, like let's say I had a guitar that lived in, uh, well, I have one now. Mm -hmm. It lives in either open D yeah. or D standard, mm -hmm. right? So what would you say string gauge set wise? I mean, obviously you're going to want to go for a heavier set to kind of hold up to that tuning. Mm -hmm. um, but is there like a specific gauge you would start with? So in general, you know, let's say you play 10s, right? Yeah. I would adjust that 10 to an 11 for that top D. I would adjust that 13 or 13 and a half to a 14 um, for the A. Then F sharp, so you only have a half, uh, a half a semitone difference between the G and the F sharp. So I wouldn't go up too much. I might keep that at a 17 or I might play with an 18 depending on your particular vibe. And then DAD. So we're going to keep the 26 and 36 from the set of 10s for yeah. the A and the D. And then for that low D, we'd take that 46 or 48, I'd say up to a 50 or a 52. Got it. So that's how I would approach it generally. Right. Um, the tension calculator makes this a little bit easier to kind of play around with and see. It does depend on the player and the guitar and the scale length and all that a little bit too. Got it. Um, but yeah, you can adjust like that to you know basically get a set that though it would feel like a little bit larger in terms of the diameter of the string, it'll respond the way a set of 10s will in regular E. So there you go. That's everything that you need to know about guitar strings. Huge thanks to Scott and the whole crew over at Stringjoy for taking time out of their really busy production schedule to let Chris and I walk around there for a few hours. I learned a ton by listening to Scott and watching them do what they do, and I really appreciate uh, them allowing us to take some cameras in there and film their whole process. If you're interested in finding out more about Stringjoy strings, I'll have them linked in the description box down below. Again, this video is not sponsored, but they have sent me a few uh, free packs of strings in the past few weeks. 
So thanks to them for that. Uh, be sure to check out the Inner Circle for the extended cut of this video. You can also find links to my video courses, my Helix presets, camper profiles, and coming very soon, Axe FX 3 presets. I finally have some fractal audio stuff coming for those of you that have been asking, so, so keep an eye out for that. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Rhett Scholl, and remember there is no plan B.